to our session on uh, climate change negotiation and global agreement. We, um, we are meeting in the context uh, where leaders from around the world will meet in Glasgow uh, to discuss how to enhance the global climate ambition and to enable the transformation that's required to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. It is depressing that the world's leaders can come together to propel dramatic reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in the coming decade. At the same time, uh, we must support the world's most vulnerable populations who are already at risk from climatic change. More investment must be made in restoring our natural environment and promoting nature-based solutions to carbon pollution. The IPCC estimates that around 1 million animal and plant species are threatened with extinction due to global warming. Failure to address climate change increases the probability of massive erosions of coastlines, topsoil loss from flooding, drought in agricultural regions, and a deterioration in air and water quality. So the stakes could not be higher. We're looking for new, more ambitious steps. They're critical to keep a 1.5 degree limit on global average temperatures. We are seeing this week record temperatures of 124 to 125 degrees Celsius in the Persian Gulf. So impactful changes that affect um, inhabitability. These changes must be taken into account within the context of human suffering and economic setbacks that have come about during the COVID-19 pandemic. The World Bank estimates that COVID-19 may have added as many as 115 million people into extreme poverty in 2020, rising to as many as 150 million uh, by the end of this year. So the health and economic crisis spurred by the pandemic has, uh, has increased income inequality, it's diminished prosperity uh, as defined as the income of the poorest 40% of, of a country's population. And it's exacerbated these deep inequalities across the global economic system country by country. Our panelists today have dedicated their careers to responding to the climate crisis and represent an amazing brain trust of knowledge on how to move the no needle forward on global negotiations. We're honored to have them with us today to share their insights. We look forward to hearing their thoughts on the lessons learned and the path forward on global climate policy. Our, our three panelists today are um, Professor Teresa Ribera Rodriguez, who is Minister for Ecology, I'm sorry, Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister for the Ecological Transition of Spain. My apologies. Uh, uh, joining us later will be Ms. Lawrence Tubiana, who is the CEO of the European Climate Foundation. And we're joined today uh, by Laurent Michel, uh, General Director for Energy and Climate Change in the Ministry of Ecological Transition of France. We're going to begin our session with a pres brief presentation um, by the French minister, um, Barbara Pompili, who is the Minister for Ecological Transition of France. Okay, we're obviously having a technical difficulty. So I'm going to ask uh, Her Excellency uh, Professor Ribera to make her opening remarks. Thank you, thank you, Amy, and thanks a lot for this invitation um, to share some views on probably one of the most challenging issues for anyone dealing with economics and dealing with uh, um, the building, the shaping of um, a new reality and a new idea of prosperity much more consistent with uh, 
the, uh, the ecological limits of the of the planet. I think that uh, there's a broad consensus, an equivocal consensus on the um, science community um, about the importance of limiting the increase of the global temperature up to 1.5 degrees Celsius um, as um, a relevant limit. Uh, uh, the same way it was committed in, in Paris uh, more than five years ago. And I think that uh, the most impressive thing is that uh, the main goal for Glasgow is very precisely to be sure that this goal is within reach. The 1.5 must be within reach. And this um, implies that we all need to be very confident, but also very constructive and realistic on how we show the way to achieve this goal um, along the next decade. The net zero is the new benchmark set by science. We need to, to, to reach um, this net zero by the middle of the century. And this implies to work on long-term strategies and nationally determined contributions so to have some milestones in the midterm and uh, to do in a manner that it is consistent with um, the actual knowledge of uh, the different technologies, the right combination of measures, paying attention to the social impacts of what we do and trying to ensure that we can go along in a way that society supports, digests and builds into this new reality. So I think that uh, the momentum behind climate neutrality is um, it's very interesting to see how, how much and how fast is growing. I think that this is something that it is very much uh, among the different um, stakeholders as something that we all need to achieve, we all need to support. It is part of um, what um, all the international bodies dealing with uh, energy, dealing with climate, insist on a possible way to facilitate the transformation and to have some benchmarks, some ideas, some reference on what it means to commit to net zero goal. This is part of the European legislation. This is part of our domestic legislation in Spain. But it is not only an European approach. There are many countries in different regions of the world supporting and committing to this goal. And I think that this is very important. Climate neutrality by mid-century is quite a challenging goal, but it is interesting to see how far and how fast the different countries are building around this idea. We could say that the spirit of Paris is growing up and it is doing steadily in the last months. I think that now that 70% of global emissions are covered by a net zero goal, taking into consideration all the contributions being made, being communicated to the United Nations, we are in a different context. But this is not enough. We are still far away from what we need to do and we are still far away from a consistent version on how to combine the mid-term goals with the long-term goals so to facilitate the deep transformation that all the economic players need to undertake. We in Spain feel uh, deeply committed to achieve this goal and we have been working intensively in an energy climate framework uh, that provides the different approaches that we need to combine in energy policies, in um, bi biodiversity, and uh, climate policies, so to work in resilience and adaptation, fiscal policies that need to be grown up, um, but also trying to develop mobility infrastructures and urban agenda policies so that we can spread a little bit everywhere what we need to do in the coming years. We have recently approved a national law on climate change and energy transition. The first we have um, adopted in Spain. Uh, so knowing that probably we we are delayed by other, when comparing with other countries, but I think that it, it introduces very interesting changes in the way we can accelerate the transformation. Together with the law, we have a, a very sound uh, roadmap uh, in the long-term perspective to achieve this net zero and an interesting and quite sound, economically sound, approach in the, in the goals, uh, in, the, in the national energy strategy to achieve the goals by 2030 with a great increase of the electrification rates and a great increase of renewable energy solutions and efficiency patterns all around um, the economy. This is the, the main um, pillar 
of the recovery plans. We think that uh, this provides a very good opportunity to accelerate some of these transformations. And we think that um, we need to be consistent with the idea of do not adding significant harm to the way uh, we deal with um, national budgets and a uh, private economy. This is why the climate law states that no new exploration authorizations dealing with fossil fuels will be permitted uh, in the time to be. And this is why we have been working intensively in the just transition processes to facilitate the phase out of uh, the whole coal capacity in the coming years. Up to now, in three years, we have phased out 84% of um, the coal capacity in a, in a very, how to say, intense manner. So paying attention to the local effects, to the effects on the workers, to the effects on the local economy. I insist on this because this is also very interesting to be taken into consideration when dealing with the impact on consumers. Um, I'm sure that our French colleagues um, have also some good ideas to share with all of us. But when talking about just transition, when talking about carbon pricing and economic signals, we cannot forget the importance of making it in a fair manner. Carbon pricing is a good idea, so to provide a signal on cost and to accelerate the transformation of the investments in new technologies. But it may have regressive impacts on consumers. So we need to adapt this transformation, taking into consideration these distributional effects and paying attention to the social dividend, but also to the access to the carbon dividend that the carbon pricing provides. The decarbonization of our economies must go beyond governments. We need that everybody backs and is on board when talking about decarbonization. And my impression is that the industry, the corporates, of course, depending on the intensity of um, the carbon that they have in their portfolios may differ. But in general terms, the agenda is being accepted and backed by the economic players. We need to pay much attention not um, to leave anyone behind in social terms. So I think that mapping the new global plans on how to facilitate this transformation is key. And this is the main task for Glasgow, dealing with consistent and um, reliable plans at the domestic uh, level is quite important. And ensuring that the capacity of the society to support this transformation is always available is also key to succeed in this, um, in this, uh, in this challenge. Thank you, Amy. Thank you very much. Now we will go to the uh, prepared remarks from the minister from France. Ladies and gentlemen, I could not be with you all today, but I deeply wanted to share with you some thoughts. Because the pandemic that affects us all has stressed more than ever the need to change the need to act quickly, decisively, the urgent need to tackle climate change. And to do so, the cure is well known. It is the Paris Agreement. You are all well aware that France is deeply committed to achieving carbon neutrality and reducing our carbon footprint. It requires a fundamental change in our, in our economy's DNA. The building sector, industry, energy, transportation, agriculture, we aim at nothing less than complete decarbonation by 2050. And I must say this, time for statesmen or great strategies can, that fail to be implemented has passed. Years ago, when we saw Amazonia and Australia burning, as the International Energy Agency reported recently, now we need to deploy massively all available and efficient energy technologies. We need to strengthen innovation. We need to cooperate more than ever before. And as leaders, either in politics or business, we have the solemn responsibility to conduct those changes. In France, we have decided to embrace the challenges we face. All fossil fuel cars will be banned from selling by 2040. 
our last coal plants are finally closing. We are increasing the pace of energy renovations and will ban the rental of energy strainers as of 2028. Renewable energies are now deploying everywhere, offshore as inland. At the European level, we have committed to a 55% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. And now we are taking the first step towards a carbon border adjustment mechanism, which I strongly support. It will ensure a level playing field between Europe and its economic partners. All of this is unprecedented, but it's not enough. Because we will only succeed with everyone on board, citizens, community, businesses. And democracy has so much to offer dealing with climate change. In France, 150 of our citizens dedicated nine months of their lives to prove so, inspiring the climate and resilience draft law, which is currently being discussed in Parliament. And obviously, to conduct such a transformation, we will need the help of economists to better assess its impacts and enhance its acceptability, also learning from our mutual experiences. And I believe that your three days event will help doing so. So I wish you fruitful discussions and look forward to discussing these subjects further. Thank you all. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Lawrence Tobiano. Welcome everybody and uh, first I want to say how happy I am to participate to this major conference with so excellent colleagues and in particular two good friends and two ministers, prominent ministers of environment and ecological transition, both uh, Barbara Pompili from France and Teresa Ribera from Spain. So very happy to be in that context and uh, expecting all the feedback of this panel. I wanted to share with you why Glasgow conference in November 2021 is so important for the Paris Agreement. And uh, of course, Paris Agreement was a key uh, task for me uh, in 2015. And of course, I'm very happy to see this flourishing, even if there are, of course, high and lows and difficulties. But for the Paris Agreement, Glasgow is a moment of truth. In 2015, before the agreement was completed, we, uh, the, the idea was that in 2020, now 2021, because of the COVID crisis, all countries that have presented provisional, well, we call them intended national determined term contribution, their climate plans in 2015, and, and we knew that they were provisional. And when we made the assessment in Paris, just before the full negotiation period, we, of course, we assessed that that will not be enough for, of course, tackling the big risk of climate change. And when the Paris Agreement was totally completed, uh, and it is part of the text, we saw that the global goals of Paris, which I think now everybody agrees on net zero emission by 2050 or soon after, and um, in a way trying to really keep the 1.5 as a global warming uh, uh, degrees added up to what we have currently as uh, temperature in particular compared to the pre-industrial period should not be, uh, be beyond 1.5. And these are two elements of the Paris Agreement, which of course require more ambitious plan than the ones who were presented in December in Paris and anyway, before December in Paris, actually. So this moment is very important because at the moment where the countries has to come forward with much better plans. And we have seen progress made by some, but we are still far away. We are still for the moment when we look at, at that moment in time and when this conference will take place, we'll not have these elements to be sure that we can even go well below two degrees C with the actual plants which are on the table. So this white Glasgow is important. And you know, the mechanism of, of Paris is every country revise its uh, contribution very often every five years. 
So in 2023, already the countries has to put climate plans that has to go beyond 2030 and we are more ambitious, again, closing the gap progressively. So Glasgow, in a way, everything is on 2030 better targets, but at the same time, having a perspective of how we we go from, we bridge from 2030 targets to the net zero by 2050. And you may have recognized that now in many circles and many countries actually has committed to be net zero emissions by uh, 2050 or soon after 2060 for China, for example. So the next round will be decisive as well. But in a way, the good thing on if I can be happy and I can share my unhappiness as well, is that Paris Agreement until now uh, has had high and lows. 2015, of course, and we, we know uh, the shock of the uh, United States withdrawing from Paris Agreement, uh, decided by President Trump, and, and now hopefully, of course, that's a different context, which I really rejoice in, and I'm relieved. But now, beyond the, you, the Convention on Climate Change, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Paris Agreement goals have been really distributed all across all the decision makers that make a difference for climate change. And you know, it's not only the governments, it's the financial institutions, the private investors, the businesses, the local authorities. So all these actors, which we try to, in a way, uh, encapsulate in the Paris Agreement philosophy are now taking Paris Agreement goals as a reference. And that is very important. And, and in a way, that's a very good news, even if, of course, uh, we have different uh, quality of this engagement, but um, now it is across the board. And, and every financial country, even central banks, or are thinking about how to be consistent with net zero emission by 2050 to be consistent with Paris Agreement. So the alignment with Paris is a big, is a big uh, question. So uh, again, uh, we are in a period where uh, we see sometimes front runners who are really serious about putting them their, their long-term plans and their short-term targets. There are laggards, of course. And so that's why I think for Glasgow, that my, in a way, second point, we need, uh, accountability and transparency, both from the government side, but as well from uh, the, the, you know, as a businesses, investors, all the private sector has to be in a way um, uh, truth to the, what they want, but what they say. So we need accountability in a much broader sense that was uh, elaborated before, we have within the Convention on Climate Change a system of transparency that we have finally to, to in a way, achieve totally by Glasgow. But it is a peer review between governments and, in a way, nation state achievements. We need something similar uh, to, to make accountable uh, all the, the goodwill, in a way, the good actors that want really to achieve net zero by 2050. Why is this so? Because we need really, um, you know, everything is about the expectation of everyone. And if all the investors think that uh, net zero emission by 2050 is a goal, this is a way to go, there are clear pathways, this will force and improve the, the trend of the economy. The global economy will follow that. Uh, of course, the financial community being a very important one in that matter. But the same for the technology used by businesses or the same by the plan for uh, cities. Just think about the mobility plans of cities. If they are now well aligned with Paris Agreement, that means that they want really to have, for example, low emission zones. So I would say from that point of view, uh, the signal has to be credible. That's why we need this accountability mechanism. What is, of course, more complicated these days is the fact that climate change, as any global issue, and we see that in the COVID crisis and the problem of vaccines, is not isolated for other tension in the geopolitical realm. And um, the, the, the big achievement of Paris is, for the first time, 
we didn't consider climate change uh, issue as necessarily a zero sum game that some will lose and some will win, but that everybody has to win because everybody is threatened by climate change and the solution to combat climate change to transition to a green economy can be has to be a benefit for all. So this zero sum game is, is coming back a little bit now, both in countries, and you see that some citizen or groups or political parties uh, creating a tension saying the climate action is against the people, is against the well-being of people. But it is true at the global level as well, where developing countries are very anxious about uh, being left on the side because of the recovery plans, the COVID crisis, the deep crisis that, that is affecting them already. And that, uh, of course, cannot be uh, just replaced by a good climate action and good climate investment. So to avoid the zero sum game, we have to really develop even more a true multilateral system, a true solidarity, and in a way understand that we cannot isolate climate change from many other political issues and that's the complexity. So that's why I think more than ever, the multilateral system is precious because you have the voices of the smaller countries, the less developed countries, as well as the point of view of the big players. That's why the club like G7 and G20 are very important. But I do think that we cannot have achieved a strong climate action plan if the more affected countries and the more the countries that didn't have any responsibility, by the way, in the in the emissions, has to be there at the table and their voice listened to. So that I think the stake for Glasgow they are very high, and we have to work all together to make this happen successfully. Thank you. Well, very good. So we're going to move now to our moderated session. And then after that, we will open up to uh, your questions. Um, so please, uh, you can begin to add your questions um, uh, through the chat function. So I'm going to open with a question um, for, for both of our panelists that are here right now. Uh, U.S. President Biden has uh, convened world leaders back in April uh, to discuss climate change and to demonstrate the United States' return um, to engagement on climate action. Uh, did that meeting tell us anything important about the challenges that will face leaders in Glasgow? Uh, Vice Minister Ribeiro, why don't you go first? Minister Ribera, can you hear us? I suggest we start with a question to Laurent. In the meantime, I will try to help uh, the Vice President to connect. Okay, uh, Laurent, uh, there is so much ground that needs to be covered in Glasgow and the commitments have been announced to date seem to lack the level of ambition that's needed. What is your recommendation for what should be prioritized? Yes, uh, thank you. And good uh, morning to everybody. First, I would like to uh, apologize. Our 
Minister Baba Pompili uh, on Wednesdays, as always, a meeting of ministers around the president, so she could only make a statement and not attend the meeting uh, that she, she would like she would have liked to be. So it's a very interesting and important question. And already Teresa Ribera and Laura Sudan have already put things right on the table, I, I, I think. Uh, this COP, uh, as it was forecast uh, in the Paris Agreement, is important because it's both a momentum in which countries have to raise their ambitions uh, and credible ambitions, if I can say. Uh, that's why it's so important that in different countries or block of countries such as European Union, but others, you, you, we have the commitments, but also the different laws, recovery plans, and uh, other action plans uh, showing that these uh, plans and targets are not only figures, but uh, real action. It's uh, also, as Laurent Tubiana said, uh, a COP in, in which some very important and technical points, which I know much less than Laurence Tubiana or Teresa uh, Albert, have to be discussed. Some points of negotiations of the Paris Agreement, for instance, the Article 6 uh, regarding, uh, or among them, carbon trading mechanism. It's not resolved yet. And all these questions of accountability and of mechanism is important to create uh, the confidence be between stakeholders, uh, between countries, and then take orders. Uh, that's uh, one point. And probably one uh, of another topic, which is which has always been difficult, but uh, which is something necessary, first I think it's necessary, and then it's reachable. It's a question, the issue of finance. Uh, we will have to start discussion on the determination of the next collective financial target after 2055. And we have to ensure that the discussion be, can be conducted in a constructive manner. And we'll have uh, to increase perhaps the transparency and visibility from developed countries on their commitments, on their current commitments for finance. And uh, also, and our president stated that in the summit in Dece last December, we uh, need to show greater ambition on climate finance, not only after 2025, but like right now, for the period 2021-2025. That, that can be some, perhaps some points I would like to share with you. And just to uh, to complete or to say, I entirely agree with what Laurence Tubiana said uh, about the question of say, consistency, commitment, delivery, and not only uh, from uh, the, the United States, the United Nations member states, that's very important, but globally to use to take a profit of this COP to go on with the momentum on the commitments. Really, I've seen, I think we've seen real changes six or 10 years ago, Paris Agreement or national commitments were things for experts. And you had people who believed in that, people who said, no, it's, uh, it's only a bad moment. Let's let that pass. And afterwards we'll do a uh, business as usual. And you had many people wondering what it was. Now, as Laurence Tubina said, the goals are shared and there are more and more for climate neutrality taken for, by local authorities, by businesses, by businesses, corporations, or by companies as target with action plans. So, and in France, we have a, a, what we call the low, national low carbon strategy. This first was adopted right after the Paris, uh, right just before the Paris Agreement in 2015. Now we have revised it. And five years ago, it was only an expert document, a document for experts. Now it's really surprising how people say we, we try in business or in other sectors to stick to the trajectory and the targets. And that, that's important. And uh, it, Something, of course, COP cannot go into details, but we, the question of just transition and the question of solidarity between people, uh, with people, with se economic sectors in a country, but also worldwide, something very important. That's why so solidarity and finance uh, are, are, of course, uh, always very important topics at the COP. Thank you very much. Uh, uh... Laurent, welcome, uh, uh, Lawrence, welcome to you. Thank you for joining us live. Uh, 
I know uh, uh, Deputy Minister uh, Rivera needs to leave in a moment, so I just wanted to ask her if she can offer a few last mo uh, comments on um, Spain's uh, leadership in building green industry. Um, what can you tell us about, um, about green industry and what lessons can we learn from Spain's experience? Thank you. I uh, thank you for the question. I uh, will try to um, to respond and to comment on this question. And apologies because I'm not in my office, and it it, it seems that the internet connection is not very stable. So apologies if um, if things do not work as um, as they should. Uh, yes, I think it is very important, as I was commenting in my introductory remarks, to pay attention to the social impacts of this transition, this transformation. I think that it is key that something that it is um, uh, relevant and positive for the economy, the, the community, um, uh, and the planet, uh, in the in the midterm, in the long term, and that builds many opportunities. Um, uh, as long as we walk the path, um, we need to pay attention. Can you hear me, Amy? Apologies. Yes. yes, we can hear you now. Go ahead, please proceed. Okay. okay, apologies, apologies for this. I was saying that we, we need to build on the opportunities, but we need to pay attention to the non-positive um, effects that uh, the transition times may have in normal people, in citizens, in workers, in consumers, in the industry. We know that, uh, I, as I was commenting, the carbon pricing is important, but we invented this thing of uh, compensations of CO2 for the industry, knowing that it could take a little bit longer to adapt the industrial processes. And it also works when talking about jobs and when talking about domestic consumers, households. When talking about works within jobs, sorry, I think it is very important to build and come along with the local communities to build alternative proposals. And we have done it paying attention to those elements that uh, were in the hand of the administration, the regulatory references that we could play with. So for instance, how we decide on the capacity to evacuate electricity when we phase out a coal plant. We thought that it could be a good idea to make a public tender taking into consideration other social and local elements, how it can impact positively in the local communities, how it can, um, how can the new uh, power developments, renewables energy developments could work in a, in a way that it is um, uh, consistent with other uh, economic activities or how the, 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 um, the uh, utilities, the business willing to, to, to have this possibility would be ready to invest in reskilling of the people or participating um, in the new developments of the local community. So ensuring that the local communities um, do decide on their own future and facilitating resources to invest in the, in, the, in the local area where the change is taking place. The next challenge to our view is to pay attention to consumers, how it can affect consumers if there is a big raise of the electricity prices and how we need to pay attention and to open a discussion on what about the carbon dividend and to what extent both with fiscal measures, but also with the difference um, in the returns in the dividends that, that um, are uh, being received by the companies. There may be a support for all the households and all the industries that see how the electricity price uh, is raising. And this is something which is still open, but we are convinced that it is a very relevant politically and economically and socially discussion to avoid uh, what we saw uh, in the case of France when trying to reflect the cost of carbon in the, uh, um, in the oil prices and, and then the people living in the rural areas thought that it was not fair to, to ask them to, 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 to increase their burden in terms of uh, prices of, of oil and gas. So I think that these are very important elements when talking about the transition. What are the positive effects? 
so to fit the opportunities and what are the negative effects that we need to pay attention to all along the years that the transition uh, takes place to avoid a contestation from those that are more vulnerable and could uh, um, benefit from the final results, but do feel menaced by the transition times. Thank you very much. Well, Lorenz, bringing you into the conversation, um, it's been mentioned already about the new European Union climate law, uh, which of course has a target of 55% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2030. Um, law still needs to be approved. Um, how optimistic are you that it's going to move forward? And um, do you think the EU's strong position um, on its carbon mitigation strategies, how do you think that's going to influence negotiations this time around? Thank you, and sorry, I had connection problem as well. Um, what uh, I think the important, of course, blocks have been built throughout these last two years uh, on the uh, Green Deal, the European Green Deal, uh, and in a way, uh, it, they are important because even now the details, uh, even the devil will be in all the details and there are many, many. I will come back to that in a minute. Uh, but still the, the, the fact that this uh, Green Deal was uh, decided before, of course, the COVID crisis and uh, in the midst and confirmed in the midst of the COVID crisis. And of course, with the uh, target for 2030 means that there is, even with all the difficulties, a solid a solid ground for it. And so I'm not, uh, and I hope Teresa is as optimistic as I am, even with the difficulties, it is a very solid ground. Why? Because the Green Deal is not something on the top uh, from the top of the European uh, bureaucracy or only the leaders of the different member states is really coming out of the European election and the desires of most uh, European citizens that we have to do something strong on climate. So this is important because then we will have, of course, all the technicalities on the policies to develop. Of course, now where, where we are, we have a, a, a big block, which is what has been approved as with a multilateral financial framework, the budget, plus of course, the recovery plans who points to anyway, climate friendly action or uh, do no harm element, which are embedded in these uh, two elements. Uh, and 37% is, is higher, much higher than what's decided in the previous budget and the previous type of recovery. Plus this solidarity element, at least within EU, which is important. Now, of course, we have to do the detail, which is how we translate the 55%. The climate law is in a way, is leaving a lot of things open. There are the target, there are of course this mechanism of governance, but more than that, everything has to be defined by the different files, the policy files that will start after the communication, uh, well, the, the, the declaration and the proposal of the commission coming uh, on the 14th of July. We have more than, I think they in the pipeline more for 50, element, legislative elements that will go from uh, uh, circular economy, industry, uh, energy efficiency, carbon markets, as we know the reform of ETS and many more uh, standards, of course, on, on the vehicles, uh, infrastructure spending. So there is many, many, many details that would bring the 55% uh, as a reality. And that's why I think the name was well chosen on fit, fit for 55 is exactly the way uh, we have to, in a way, uh, discuss that. I do think that it's a, it's a good moving target because 55% of emission reduction is of course, the slope is much stronger than, uh, than what we have witnessed until 2020. So it's really a big transformation and uh, we have to count on uh, the snowball effect that the expectation of every economic actors in particular with that uh, even in the sector that for the moment we are protected from any serious decarbonization scenario like uh, cement or steel or others uh, in, by, in the fact for the moment the ETS has functioned mainly and mostly for electricity. Uh, it has now to really have an impact on the 
on the level of emission for other industries as well. And there is, of course, the chemical industry, the steel, the cement, and some others who, for the moment, has to start really the transformation. So, and then, as, as you know, uh, there is a prospect to get to 55% using the carbon pricing mechanism to grow the sector, in particular, the transport and the buildings, uh, the housing, and, and of course, that will, will raise a number of, of questions, in particular, on the, the elements that Teresa Ribera just mentioned, the social impact of these measures, and how uh, we have to be really super, super uh, cautious and, and preventing any regressive effect on this particular policy. So the 55% cannot be at the price of the social justice and cannot be uh, making the poorest household or uh, bearing the cost of policies that finally will impact their well-being. That is an absolute condition. And that's not just the Just Transition Fund only. It's much broader than that. It's really to look at every element uh, in terms of regressiveness or progressiveness vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, in particular, the, the, the poorest household in Europe and the poorest region, what the impact is. How much this will, so that for me, a very important still, and still not nature, we don't know. And that will be two years of discussion, probably, and, and of course, even more uh, was, was, a trans, you know, was a translation into a national law for, for many of them. How much this is helping EU to shift the, the trend? Um, there is good elements and bad elements at the global level that we have to measure the impact of EU. The good elements is uh, EU is engaged and in a way that resonates with the Biden program with in a way more solidity on the EU side because we, have, we will have more stable institutions and this will not, cannot be reversed in two years time. So, uh, but, but in a way that interesting that signal go in the same direction, full decarbonization of the power sector quite soon now, uh, electrification of transport and, and putting climate everywhere in the uh, policy agenda. So that's important from the international point of view that the global economy, the different actors, in a way, and that was uh, Michel, uh, Laurent Michel was saying, uh, it, this is a signal that now people don't ignore. That said, still, and because of the COVID crisis and the vaccine, vaccine crisis, uh, the problem of solidarity between regions, uh, comparison between the 10 trillions spent on the recovery plans in developed countries and the difficulties that to find the 50 billion that Kristalina Georgieva is talking about to get uh, really enough vaccine sent to uh, or produced for the developing countries. There is an increased anger from the developing countries uh, against developed countries. That is a, a really a very divisive factor for, for Glasgow. And finally, of course, the geopolitical tension that we cannot ignore. Uh, we cannot isolate climate from uh, the, the dispute on trade, on human rights, on military elements, on security uh, that are now uh, uh, really very, very even between US and China and Europe and China, and even UK as a presidency in China. So it's, it's worrying. So in a, in a better, more peaceful world, the EU example will have tracked enormous momentum. It is, but we have a lot of obstacles. That's why it's really important that, in a way, the Green Deal idea is, is trying, in a way, brought at home in many countries and, in a way, digested in many countries, in particular in the developing, in the global south. That's the only way that the EU traction would, would be as efficient because other countries, other society will embark on and, and with their own definition, by the way, of their own Green Deal. So uh, that's, that's where I am in, in the assessment of the situation today. Uh, Laurent, do you want to weigh in? Do you see this uh, uh, helping the uh, global south with the green, uh, with a green industrialization plan uh, as the path forward? What do you see as um, something that can bridge this gap because we do have uh, this challenge of the inequities that have been laid bare uh, by the pandemic and the differential pace uh, in economic recovery because of the uh, disparities in, in pace of global vaccination. So um, 
what, what do you think needs to be done? That's interesting to listen to African leaders these days that we see summit in, 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 Paris, in, in France uh, just 15 days ago. Um, you, you, see, um, you, you see, they are telling what? They, we, they want to embark into a accelerated de economic development process. They are not against green. They are not sure that the money will be there. So first, I think we have to resolve the financial equation, which is not only public funding, but when everybody is telling the Global South uh, that the, the, the issue is about shifting the trillions for investing in the green recovery, uh, they don't believe it because the access to capital market is still too, too expensive. So uh, first, in a way, first condition is to, in a way, use the financial instrument we have, the new allocation of the um, special drawing rights, the reallocation of them into uh, facilities or, or capacities to, in a way, attract private investment in reasonable financial condition and not, of course, uh, at the cost they are, we are witnessing now. Second, I think we need really uh, to bundle offers to uh, the industrialization, in particular, the uh, the access to energy is totally central these days. Uh, and, and we see, of course, positive evolution in the discussion in Vietnam, for example, or while well, Indonesia is probably struggling still with, with a very, in a way, not a des clear decision not to uh, get out of coal. But we, you see in, uh, South, in Southeast Asia movement uh, on that direction. So there is really to just to contribute and support but then at the other side, uh, yeah, on other countries, there is this lack of capital seems in India even, even uh, which of course it's not of course a less developed economy, but still struggling to get access. And, and we have to make offers that uh, the financial system, the, the industry has to offer clean energy access, accessibility in terms of uh, scale up projects. And we don't have that pipeline for the moment still. And, uh, and, you know, on the other side, um, there is a, a, a lot of offer to really explore and exploit more fossil fuel resources in Africa, for example. Uh, we have a big investment on, on gas uh, that is coming, and, and there is a plea and a campaign for developing gas as a sustainable energy for Africa at that particular moment. And, you know, it's uh, with that different countries behind that offer, of course, different companies, but it is terrible to see that we are not able to offer the alternative solution, which again, at, at, the, at, at the cost, at the economic cost. And, and it's not because uh, the clean energy, like clean electricity is cheap, to, is too expensive to provide, is a combination of the financial capital with, with, uh, with the technology. So that's the way I would see it. We should not, uh, probably we have been too piecemeal approach for at least this group of countries in Africa. Uh, Southeast Asia is starting, but we need to be much more effective. And then finally, finally, to stop subsidizing and supporting the, the in a way, the export of, of, of coal power plants or the technology or the, uh, the, the, the subsidies in general. This has to stop. If not, uh, that just we are we but the example cannot be followed finally because you don't you have totally a disruption of the market. Uh, Laurent Michel, uh, you mentioned finance uh, in at the beginning of the session. Uh, how are you seeing this question of how to finance uh, clean energy or other things? What should be done um, for the global south? How, how do you see um, uh, the negotiations and the kinds of things that could be done to make it, as uh, Lorenz said, less piecemeal. Yes, I, I'm not so much involved in, in the finance negotiations of the COP, but uh, as Laurence said, and you have questions of amounts, uh, you have questions of coherence of industrialization and on making things uh, possible. Uh, we, we can do uh, just in some frameworks, in existing frameworks, uh, we can do already much more to the least developed countries. There was a, uh, last year an OECD report uh, on the uh, climate finance mobilized by developed countries to developing countries. And uh, from 2016 to 2018, only 14% went to the least developed countries and 2% to the small uh, island developing states. So 
it's, it means that you, we can do better. Is it a qu question of uh, perhaps capacity building, a uh, question of uh, more and more focus on all the development, national and regional and international development banks? I think they've made in France, it's been a really um, a big priority for the Agence Française de Développement. They've made a shift to support the clean energy development, clean, uh, access for people to affordable and sustainable energy. So, the, and we've seen that uh, things are, are possible, but is, is it enough? Some six years ago in the Paris uh, COP, there were many initiatives called, the, there was a coalition for actions, there was a International Solar Alliance or uh, other actions for resilience and so on. Uh, they've made some improvements, but probably uh, we, are, we have to, to, to scale up and we have also to be coherent and probably to, to go faster in each developed countries. Today, we've, we've seen for several years that we've changed our rules for uh, export uh, support, uh, the, what we call credit export, uh, export credits, and progressively we reduced the support to uh, for fossil projects, but probably not fast enough. Uh, it was important to to see in the last G7 meeting of the ministers for environment and they dealt with uh, was climate and energy that really there was a declaration saying that the G7 countries would, would stop uh, the support to coal projects. And we have to uh, address now the question of gas, perhaps in, in some specific cases, uh, really, if you really replace coal and not create a gas flow for decades, you, you can still go on with gas. But uh, the last IEA report, International Energy Agency, uh, clearly stated that if we want to reach uh, net zero by 2050, we must not add so much gas in, in the system and perhaps even stop development of new gas fields. So uh, it cannot happen if you go on subsidizing and if you don't have, on the other hand, uh, the scaling up of finance and projects with uh, affordable energy uh, or affordable electric cars, uh, uh, of course, it's probably not at the same pace that in some developing countries will have electric vehicles at the same reason as it's now occurring in, uh, let's say, Western Europe and the more uh, advanced countries such as Norway. But uh, in France, uh, what, what would be, okay, it's important that France holds its commitment and that we develop this cars, but we have to have more and more uh, a global view on that and that also this kind of cars and feed, fed by clean energy are affordable more and more for the developing countries. Uh, otherwise, you, you'll have to empty the ocean with, with a small glass. So uh, really, as, as I said, President Macron already pledged uh, for uh, an increase from 5 billion euros in 2020 to 7 billion euros for the uh, most uh, uh, the least developed countries. Perhaps we have to find uh, to how to reinforce the Green Climate Fund, which is a you know important channel to support LDCs and small island development. And we have also set to embark banks and private sector. Uh, more in, of course, we are not uh, in an angel's world, but the pressure on stakeholders, on shareholders, on the investors will also probably be key uh, to uh, promote. Uh, say, to promote money towards green investment and not in small river, but a big river. It's, uh, will it happen? It's not so easy. If it was easy, we'd have a solution. But yeah, there's no other view that to have a more, uh, more solidarity towards less developed countries, towards people affected by the transitions. Be there, they can be in developed countries, coal miners or people working in coal plants or uh, people are uh, living in the, uh, not in the center of cities, but are uh, using the car. So it's a question of a global view and also probably uh, to finish that, so to prove by action that it, it's possible because there are many fears which can uh, prevent action and we don't have time to, to prevent action now we have to act. So, uh, uh, Laurence, uh, 
if sufficient funding doesn't emerge, you know, between now and and the Glasgow meetings, what what what's your opinion on um, how that's going to affect the negotiations? Do do you think we can still move forward with more ambition pledges, or or you think that it's tied to the funding so directly? Uh, I I do think it's. Uh... It's unavoidable. That, that's why uh, recently, uh, together with other colleagues, we have been calling the attention of, of leaders, in particular uh, within the G7 context, that uh, it, it cannot. You, you put the problems that Laurent Michel described. We need the funding at scale. Uh, and not only, again, it's not only just public funding. It's a capacity to attract the private investment that uh, that is needed at scale with the, the pipeline of projects that, that are really necessary. And it's not in all regions that the funding is lacking, it's, it's in some regions. Uh, could be different again, I was mentioning India, which in a way in a middle income country, um, and in a way a, a powerful industrial power as well, but, but the problem of access to capital market is still pending. So, uh, but there is no solution. And, and because of this, on top of the COVID crisis, you cannot have a positive result in Glasgow. It's just impossible. If this is not, if there is not a step forward in the, in the right direction. There is mobilization, uh, let's say, I see, I, I know that in every capital, people are trying to respond to that. There is an effort on the multilateral development and side. And then, and then of course, the, the very strong move of the IMF uh, executive director, Kristalina Georgieva, to, to really put more money in the system, but it has to be in a way advanced enough and clear enough that people regain trust, which is already lacking. So yes, uh, for this point of view, more than ever, more than ever, the climate action negotiation, or it's not only the negotiation, is really that countries engage and see the value for them to engage in this uh, green transformation uh, is, will be dependent on, on the signal of uh, the combination of public funding support and, and of course, um, the capacity to access to capital markets. Uh, and, you know, we have been saying many years now from 2015 that uh, the question was not just 100 billion per year. Uh, we are approaching the level in 2020 probably, uh, and we will ha have it probably a, even a better number for 2021 because of the mobilization of, in particular, the multilateral development bank's effort for climate. But this is not, and, and then we said it is this number in a way too small, the problem is shifting the trillions to, to really orient this investment vis-a-vis -vis, uh, developing countries in the green sector. But the uh, and so now people don't believe it. The, they, they were interested by the idea of shifting the trillions. And you have seen many economies in many countries, but now they say it's not coming. So give us the proof that this will happen, that the financial system and the financial, in a way, markets will respond positively uh, to that, uh, to these investment opportunities. So. Um, and, and that was what I was saying. We, we need to really give the signal that we no more subsidies to coal power plants anywhere uh, at this, or, or gas new exploration, as, as he mentioned, because IEA report is up super clear. Uh, but, um, but so I, I do think it's a condition, uh, but it's a condition with precision enough. And again, people are not, the countries are not just wanting more public funding. They want more public funding and, and make sure that the, there will be action on financial market that would make the access credible. And in addition to that, and I haven't mentioned that, it's not only about investment in clean energy, et cetera. And in, it is about the, loss, the losses and damages that has affected a number of less developed countries and even middle income countries, by the way, small economies, that cannot resist this sequence of extreme events, uh, extreme weather events that are destroying their infrastructure capital. And you know, you, 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 you suffer from one typhoon or one big uh, extreme event, and then you have to, to endeavor your country to, re to, to build it or rebuild it, and then it destroyed two years after. And then that's now 
you see the Caribbean islands are a very good example, even Costa Rica, economies really solid like Costa Rica are now in a very difficult situation because of the repetitive destruction of capital. They cannot, they cannot, they cannot bear. So more we delay action, more the financial situation of it will be uh, unsolvable. So I hope everybody would listen to that, uh, to that call. And, 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 you know, last point from our moderator discussion, and I'm going to go to our questions from the audience. Um, you know, we're talking about, you know, doing something to incentivize uh, private industry, uh, and in some cases, maybe decent, you know, de incentivize, uh, you know, private actors that are still investing in coal. Of course, we have this problem that you mentioned that as infrastructure, um, is, is uh, under challenge from climate events, or even if you, know, you look at, at, at some of these low income countries, you know, the development planning you know, focuses on infrastructure the way China did you know, a decade or two ago, right? And that's a lot of cement and steel, which is high emitted. Um, so, so the question is, you know, what's your view of the, uh, both of you, what's the view of how to get the private sector um, you know, you have a lot of companies that have also pledged net zero for 2050 context, and yet maybe their immediate business plan um, really is not going to get them to where they need to be for 2030. So um, to meet that pledge. So, you know, what do we need to be doing to get the private sector into action? Well, I think uh, you, you just raised a, a very big point. There is many... Uh many good commitments, uh, again, uh, and it's positive, and I'm, of course, I'm happy of it, having worked really hard to get this in the Paris Agreement, that net zero begin by 2050, it begin a sort of a norm setter for many actors, including, of course, the companies. Now, when you look at uh, what does it mean, uh, in, in some case, many cases, uh, is not consistent with the business plan for the next 10 years and even the next five years. So there is a credibility gap there that I think is worrying. Why? Because everything is about signaling the market that this is a way the economy will be transformed. And if the signal is not trustful, it is not credible. This, you know, in Paris, the Paris Agreement doesn't have a, a sanction mechanism that would work. Uh, we don't have a global government that can punish a, a, a country or company that doesn't, uh, in a way, are not um, consistent with, with Paris engagement. So the, the only enforcement, real enforce, enforcing mechanism, and, and we knew that the crafting the agreement, is the expectation convergence. And so that's why it's so important these days, I insist a lot on, it's very good to raise to zero. But we have to be credible and we have to, in a way, see the difference between the one who, in a way, uh, commit to net zero and have a, at least a, a provisioning plan. Many things can happen, of course, during the next 30 years, but have a plan and in particular short term action that make it reasonably acceptable that it is uh, the trend will be will be followed. So this is lacking still some are some plans. Uh, we see some emerging technologies uh, which are being tested now in, in much further than pilot, like for zero carbon steel, for example. But we need now companies to be serious and in a way announce what they can and don't try to mess up the things that we are all net zero uh, already. And in particular, that of course the case on the oil and gas company where you see them saying, we, we will be net zero, but we'll still have gas and oil by 2070. It's just inconsistent. So, um, and you will not have miracle of extracting uh, carbon from the atmosphere uh, or, or uh, you know, having massive capacities of carbon capture and sequestration or, or even using this carbon. So um, this will exist, of course, uh, but that would not be order of magnitude to have oil and gas still in 2070 uh, as, as they are in the moment. So uh, I do think we need clarity and accountability. And my hope is that for Glasgow, now that this is this 
I think the goals of Paris have been digested into most and more in the system. And it's not like Laurent was saying, it's not like, oh yes, it's there, but we, we don't care. We will do business as usual. That's not the case, that's true. But now we have to have a sort of accountability mechanism. Uh, we, we have one we have to reinforce for the government. We need to have one for the companies and for investors. And that in my view would encourage everyone to be you know, we're serious. It's what we need. We just need people to be serious. Okay, I'm going to open up to some of our, our questions uh, from the audience. Uh, Laurent Michel, uh, we have a question um, from a consul general. Uh, what would be the economic effects of the EU Green Deal for the EU? Uh, how, how are you seeing that as it moves forward? Yes, that's a, a wide question. So the uh, before the COVID crisis, uh, there was a proposal of, of the Green Deal. There was a, 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 an impact study uh, showing or assessing that uh, the, uh, this transition of the Green Deal and the target, uh, which come of then the minus 55% are reachable and uh, can be globally and can globally have a positive impact, creating some, some jobs in household renovations or re renewables but also it, it does not hide on the other side that uh, it uh, can be a, a challenge for transition of uh, some economic sectors of some region territories or even countries and that we have to uh, have uh, let's say leveling policies that help the, this transition and there is also one probably perhaps that's behind the question so, a question of, let's say, international competition and attractiveness, especially for industries that are in international competition. Uh, that's why uh, 190, but which is not the only one, uh, is, the carbon, is the carbon border adjustment mechanism to say that for some sectors and in a progressive way, we have, uh, let's say, a, a kind of requirement of uh, performance on carbon if uh, for the products which are imported in the European Union. If, and if there's not this performance, they have uh, uh, in, a, in a way which have to be described in the law, in the European legislation, to pay, let's say, to, for, for the quotas. Uh, and this being in a fair manner, based on science, on benchmarks, and so compatible with, uh, of course, the uh, World Trade Organization rules. So, uh, France has supported the, this idea. We hope it can be put in place progressively, uh, but it's not the it's not the only one. It has to be, I'll say, um, a combination of uh, a, 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 a progressively higher price of carbon for this industry, but uh, support to let's say R and D and deep R and D and rupture technologies and uh, new developments, but also of their implementation. And that's uh, why you see that, and that's interesting, all the recovery plans and the European one and also the national ones, uh, that now we help companies to shift their processes. Uh, it's not easy, but really uh, that's one thing which is, I think, moving faster uh, now than five years ago. It's, let's say, in heavy industry, transformation of processes uh, with the hopes of green uh, and decarbonated hydrogen, but not only let's say in steel industry or in cement, really uh, new innovative pro processes. And uh, of course we, we have to, it's a choice of, so you're probably say, not in, especially so in the industry policy, but each kind of needs industry to decide to, uh, we need industry, we have to uh, have all, all this combination of, uh, let's say uh, ETS, ETS that drives industry to make progress, but also uh, so help to R&D and deployment, and let's say a, a fair uh, framework of competition. And afterwards, it was said that the uh, devil is in the details. You have some sectors in which uh, CBAM will work better and others not because on, let's say, free riding effects and, and so on. So uh, all of this has to, to, to be uh, addressed. And we can hope that if we address it well with a current R&D training policy or so, it, it can be positive for Europe. You can, and we finish uh, uh, with that. You, you can think on, on the other way. Uh, if China, Japan, United States and Australia and, and or even 
South America in where you have very uh, uh, interesting pro projects with green hydrogen and so on, developed all these technologies in Canada and other countries, and Europe stays behind. Uh, in 10 days, you only have to buy the, uh, this technology. So uh, I think it's, not, it's easier to say than to do, but really not only seeing this change that uh, as a problem, it's a, it's a challenge. It can be also an opportunity, but sometimes if the whole continent, or if you are in a sector, if you are in the steel sector, if you are the only one you not to move, where will you be in 10 years? So I think, and uh, that's uh, of course not easy with the present crisis, but it's, I think it's a very important signal that even after the crisis, nearly all governments are in Europe, even the ones in the Eastern countries, who have the most difficult problems with transition, go on with their greening plans, let's say, in recovery. Of course, with not the same approach and questions of solidarity, but I think the challenge has been put, uh, as no one says, that's the crisis, we have to stop and go to serious things. The question is, climate is also a serious thing, and we go on with our recovery plan and transformation plan for European economy. And the, uh, I said I would finish, but last, just one last one. Really, I think the car makers don't think the same way and don't act the same way five years now and five years ago. But of course, it's hopes, and we have to stay coherent with regulations and control. Uh, as Jean said, it's important we have pledges from companies. In France, we have what we call bilan d'émission de gaz à effet de serre, that is accounting of uh, greenhouse gas emissions for companies. Uh, introduced more than 10 years ago. Now it has really, it's, it's not be, to introduce them, it's to use them uh, as a tool. So, so we have another question, a somewhat related uh, uh, from audience member. Um, when we think about, you know, carbon border adjustments or, or some countries leading and other countries lagging, um, uh, our, our audience member asks, uh, um, do we have to use a, a, a system like the so-called climate club, right? So how do we, you know, uh, uh, solve the free rider problem? Do we have a cluster of countries that are committed? Um, they're, they're, as you mentioned, you know, uh, if the world is eventually going to move to this, uh, this kind of uh, decarbonization, obviously countries that move first are going to have a trade advantage going forward. Um, so, do we create momentum by having this so-called climate club of those who are greening first um, and then have a carbon border adjustment if you're not in the club? Uh, how, how are you seeing that? Uh, should, I, should I start? Or, or? Yeah, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sure I would be very interested, by the way, to, to hear what, what all of you are thinking. One, the, uh, in a way, academically, uh, it's theoretically, uh, it's a nice idea, no? You know, you have competitiveness issues and then you, you solve them by establish a level playing field. And um, so, and in a way you look at the WTO agreements years ago, you have this sort of specific agreement where you, you could have a, a better condition if you, if you abide to a certain type of norms. So theoretically is really interesting, but Immediately when you go into, and, and of that referred to, we cannot have a global carbon price for the moment, which would be needed, but then we could have at least uh, similar carbon prices um, and, uh, and that would in a way constitute the level playing thing we're looking for. <clears throat> but then immediately the difficulties begin when you would like to organize it. So Europe is starting to discuss this carbon border adjustment. And for the moment, the proposals that are on the table doesn't even refer to implicit carbon price, but refer to explicit carbon price. And, uh, and of course the carbon price today, uh, like we are relatively higher now um, and, and, and in Europe, and immediately you see your transatlantic uh, partner and things begins to be difficult immediately. So the club with US, well, not this year, certainly not maybe in two years time, 
But the moment where the carbon the explicit carbon, that notion is really important. And of course, I'm, I'm trying to, to plead for more cooperation oriented CBAM and not a sort of too protectionist one, is that for the moment, there is not that many countries that have comparable carbon, explicit carbon price at global level. So that's the first difficulty. It's nice. Like, uh, you know, we were talking in 2009 on having a global carbon price in global markets. It never happened. Uh, of course, we can say China is launching its uh, carbon market, but the price, you, you look at the explicit price again, uh, it will be probably around $10 a ton uh, or even, even less and then anyway. So uh, the practicality of this, in a moment where you, we should not lose time and we should accelerate climate action, I think is, uh, so I do think that, so I, I don't believe that this club will happen with reasonably, uh, in a way, comparable con economic condition that can make the club working. And I, I saw that immediately the reaction, in particular John Kerry, uh, in a way saying that the CBAM approach on EU was really protectionist and anti-American. Well, it, it was not positive out of this. And in the informal discussion we had with our colleagues that are part of the Biden administration, you see that they, they cannot, and, and you know that better than anybody, I mean, you cannot propose a carbon price law uh, these days uh, in US. So can we discuss implicit carbon price? Uh, that's of course the, that what OECD has tried to define, and, and maybe in my view it's an interesting element. But so uh, I don't believe this is a solution. That's why I, the only element we have is really to push for action, trying to use pe pe peer pressure. What I think it's possible, but will be of course delicate and a source of a lot of trade tension, is to try at least to. Uh, internally in the EU market to have a, uh, yes, a level playing field for sectors that are really suffering if they go really seriously on low carbon or zero carbon. And of course, that's a hard to abate sector, the chemicals, the seeds and the cements. If they go really for serious net zero, they will face competition from Turkey, for example, on cement or, 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 or even steel from the United States, by the way that will of course be higher in carbon content. So if it's not, uh, then we, we cannot ask them to uh, do the job. And, uh, but at the same time, they have to, to really uh, do the transformation. So that's why I'm really uh, very much in favor of, uh, we certainly uh, can study these uh, border adjustment tax, but we should first, uh, discuss exemption from less developed countries. That's for me the solidarity element, the cooperation element should should really be much important. And then really work seriously on uh, broadening the notion of what what is a carbon price in the in the diverse economy. And and that could be a more cooperative approach in my view. But anyway, that's my position, personal position. Uh, Laurent, Michelle, you want to weigh in at, at all on this topic? Yes, it's a, I think it's a difficult question and uh, really uh, the concept of climate club, yes, it's not, uh, it's not easy and uh, we've never said, and I uh, joined Laurence in the way that CBAM was the absolute weapon and it can, something we'd like to, to test and try and to, con to combine with uh, push for action in Europe with R&D and deployment of technologies. And of course, also the question and the compensations for the ones who if CBAM is not implemented or even with CBAM face a real uh, competitiveness uh, problems uh, through competitors who don't care uh, about uh, uh, carbon. Uh, so, and that, that's why there are uh, free allowances in the ETS, and we are we don't uh, intend to abandon them at the beginning of the CBAM. So, really, it's something which has to be uh, in, implemented uh, one after the, the other uh, progressively. Uh, and uh, I think I share what Lance said: exemption for least developed countries. I think can be things we can look at. Not uh, and the competition is not coming from these countries, from many of the industries we, we talk about. So 
uh, it's something we, we, we could uh, look at. And there were other ways uh, that were, the, this, um, let's say, discussed some years ago, let's say, to have global commitments from sectors, cement, industry, uh, aluminium, or steel, or others, or chemistry, all around the world. Well, so these commitments, we don't have seen them much, uh, but perhaps uh, could it be also a kind of approach that if many companies of the same sector would go to a commitment and then uh, we could have in different countries that translated into regulations to avoid free riders, perhaps. Uh, so it's a difficult question on this international competition. But at the end, we come back to the global question. If all countries progressively move to the commi their commitment, the, the problem would be, le would be less important in, if in every country you decarbonize your industry. So, have, so to combine that the national, the inter, uh, the national determined contributions be seriously implemented by, by everybody. Well, you know, it's very interesting. We only have another few minutes, but I'll just leave with the, leave the session with this paper that was uh, economist paper that was uh, just hit Twitter. Uh, two days ago, which was the idea was to pick a particular heavy industry sector, like steel, and um, and have a global agreement where there's a club, and uh, and and a carbon, a leveled carbon levelized carbon price in in the club would be set for steel, and then any steel that was imported into the club countries uh, would be subject to um, this sort of levelized cost, and then. The question is, would you take the carbon border adjustment tax that you would charge and then use that to put back into, say, something like the Global Climate Fund and use it to help um, countries decarbonize, maybe even the same sector? So, you know, kind of interesting ideas are, are, are sort of cooking afoot about how to do it, whether to do a pilot with one sector. Um, because I, I think, as you both have commented, and I know from the US perspective, um, the U.S. was very unenthusiastic about uh, collaborating on the U on the European carbon border adjustment, and and the question is, it's you know very complex. How would you do it? Um, and so maybe this question of starting with one sector, um, that's a, a traded sector, you know, might be uh, might be well, is a solution that's been proposed in the academic community. So I want. Go ahead, go ahead, Laurence. No, I think uh, in any way it, it would be very good to, and, and I, I do think that I think most governments approach these days in Europe is uh, to make tests and pilots uh, because really we, it's super complex. And when you, you want to apply that to complex products, uh, it's just a, just a nightmare. So I, I think it would be good at least to try and maybe the, the the good thing, the good positive thing on the on this discussion is that it push everybody to to be serious about uh, decarbonizing. And in a way, there is a deterrent effect which I think we should not discard. It is interesting, and uh, my my good Chinese colleagues are working on the on these potential trade measures against because of carbon since now more than ten or fifteen years. So I think it's the signal is interesting, and the way it's not just to do something which well, is a level of complexity that nobody can, can control. But that's what pilot could be really interesting in, in sectors where we see the technology ha arriving and right. still a very good example, so. Okay, well, I, I wanna thank you both uh, uh, for your outstanding comments in our discussion today. And uh, again, thank you to um, Deputy Prime Minister uh, for Ecology from Spain, Ribera and uh, for the other statement uh, from Minister Pompili. So uh, thank you very much. We look forward to other sessions. And uh, uh, again, uh, hope to see you both soon uh, at, at our institution, Climate Policy Lab at Tufts University. Thanks very much. Thank you.